with flights to Barcelona, Lisbon or Madrid. Tonight will be very cold with frost and icy stretches developing in many areas. Lows of minus four to minus one degrees Celsius. Now you're up to date on News Talk. The News Round on Off the Ball with Gillette. Start your day in flow with the new Gillette Labs Razor with exfoliating bar. This is News Talk. Welcome along to Wednesday Night's Off the Ball. We've got a really good show planned between now and 10. Dan McDonald's going to be on the football show. We've got live football tonight with Crystal Palace against Manchester United. That catch-up game, which could potentially see United catch up even more ground on the leaders' arsenal in the Premier League title race. We'll also be speaking to St. Pat's new signing Jake Mulraney, who went to the UK, then went to play in the MLS over the last few years, and the 26-year-old is now going back to Inchicore ahead of the new League of Ireland season. Matt Slater will be on hand to give us the latest on Jim Radcliffe, who is now the first publicly announced bidder for Manchester United. The Ineos boss has previously uh, been linked with taking over Chelsea before Todd Bowley took over the club. And Mick McCarthy, we've got Jerry Thornley and Andy Dunn for pretty much all of the next hour on Wednesday Night Rugby. The boys together again. The uh, I think we had a, a YouTube comment. That this was obviously um, went uh, out on YouTube a little bit earlier. Uh, I think it was like, wow, these two guys are the bromance. I didn't know I needed I think that's how people find it. It's uh, Jerry and Andy bounce beautifully off each other. Uh, if you're into rugby, it's a, it's a dream conversation. I think even if you're not into rugby, it's an hour well spent with uh, three. I'll throw you into it as well. Three uh, well-spoken uh, gentlemen of the game. With these comments, you're truly spoiling us. I don't think I was ever seen as a gentleman on a rugby pitch. This might be the first time that's ever happened. <laughs> a gentleman of the spoken word. Yeah, there you go. Um, plenty to chat about, uh, given the Ireland squad's going to be named tomorrow. And bizarrely enough, you know what the thing to talk about is? There's very little to talk about the Ireland squad because they've looked... Jerry has... It's all very nicely mapped out in the Irish Times today. He's looked at every player that Ireland have been scouting effectively for the last two years. If we include those who went into the emerging Ireland squad, the Ireland A, those development players who were looked at... He's clocking at 83 players that Andy Farrell has been assessing over the last two years at international level. So therefore, going into a World Cup year, the net has been quite wide, but now very clearly, they know exactly what they've got. Yeah. One or two players aside. Yeah, it's interesting to see how that... I think that that's how we're looking heading into 2023. As I was saying before, though, a lot can change very quickly in the game and a couple of injuries here and people stepping up there can change things ahead of the World Cup but I think in, in terms of Six Nations yeah it's stability like you know, we actually talked about this very briefly on Monday is like Ireland are actually a very stable squad and team and there will there might be room for one or two to come into it but people aren't going to get cast aside either you know and it's a, been a very successful team it's not like you know there's a reason Scotland are searching for Ben Healy in the hope that you know somebody can be a backup to or even maybe even challenge Finn Russell you know it's because Ireland sort of have what they need and have done amazingly well over the last year or two. So, yeah, like, I mean, I don't know, reading about France's injuries yesterday, I suddenly got quite excited about the Six Nations and there is that element of, like, we shouldn't just, like, look past tournaments and, you know, years as we look forward to this once every four years extravaganza. I would suggest it's never as simple as some people say where they go, "Ah, scrap the Six Nations just before the World Cup, use it to experiment. It's not as simple as you would trade winning a Six Nations for having a better World Cup. I don't think the two are actually hand in hand. Well, like England's 2003 Six Nations is always the one I counted because they did all of their they did all of their wins on tours in the summer and beat New Zealand and in, Australia in, in 2002 home. in Australia, and then had lost the final had lost to Wales, Scotland, and Ireland three years in a row in Grand Slam deciders, and then came to Lansdowne Road. Ireland were going for a Grand Slam too and destroyed us. Mary McAleese Gate, Martin Johnson Carpet Gate, Gate, whatever we call it, yeah. Uh, but, like, what did they do to us that day? It was, like, 43-5 or something like that. And that was the catalyst. You know, they needed to get, say, to show how dominant they were, to go and believe in themselves as favourites for the World Cup. You would think Ireland, you know, might... I think they believe in themselves, but I don't think it would do any harm to go and cast aside, you know, England... France at home and have and, and beat Scotland and Wales and Italy away and sort of say to themselves look at what we've done here we're going to the World Cup to win you know I, I don't know like I, I would say this is actually quite an important Six Nations Well I think particularly because France have had Ireland's number I think a good performance against France is required this time around that one seems the most important one and then obviously 
England right at the end. We'll see if there's a championship on the line. We'll see what's on the line when that game comes round. I think it's the day after St. Patrick's Day on the 18th of March. I think they're probably the two most crucial fixtures. This is always the Six Nations you target as well, the one where England and France come to Dublin. Yeah, well, yeah, traditionally. And it is the case again now as well. It it often often depends almost where Wales are. (laughs) And this might, might be one that... Yeah, God, it's an exciting Six Nations, though, isn't it? Like, you know, two new coaches. You're starting to get the buzz now at this stage, are you? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Like, we shouldn't even be talking about it. It's like the signing cup this weekend, you know? But, uh, yeah, it's it's right around the corner. And it definitely, it, I definitely am. Yeah, if it, saying it to you off air, actually, there is, like, this time of year, and with the lads, there was so much to talk about between Eddie Jones and Ben Healy, plus the actual rugby itself and Bundiaki. This time of year is brilliant for rugby. There's so much going on. And it is it is at that point now where there is lots to talk about, and the kind of more general sports fan, not the rugby fanatic, mm. really kind of gets into it and gets excited by it. I think when it comes to the Champions Cup, if the safety net of the round of sixteen being a twenty four into a sixteen wasn't there, Sale and Ulster is great this Saturday night because effectively you've got two teams who have to win. Uh, to be sure of a place in the next round because of how it's gone so far. But even in the case of Munster, so much depends on the results around them. Mm-hmm. By the time kickoff comes around on Sunday, they might they might know that a losing bonus points is enough to qualify. In Leinster's case, is it that important to be top seed from Pool A? They'll probably feel they want to beat Racing on Saturday. But it's only really when it comes to the Irish provinces, that game between Ulster and Sale, that feels like it has a real meaning around it. Because Munster know if they qualify, they're still going to have a difficult game. Yeah, absolutely. It's not like the yeah, old yeah. pool system where, you know, everything pretty much was on the line until the last weekend. Exactly. It's lesser than at the moment, unfortunately. Now, it might not stay that way forever, but it, I don't think anybody's happy with it at the moment. So, yeah, we'll see how it goes. But, yeah, at least there is at least there is a game to kind of watch with a bit of jeopardy to it this weekend. Yeah. Richie McCormick is with as well. Rich, how are you getting on? Evening, man. How are you? Not too bad. Um, I was, again, doing bits and pieces earlier this morning. I saw Rafa Nadal... Uh, going out in the Australian mm-hmm. Open at, at this stage it would appear that it's very much set up for Djokovic to win Grand Slam 22 but the big question mark about Nadal when he was saying he didn't want to uh, finish on the court without actually finishing out the match it was important for him not to retire during it but the other word about the other sense of retirement probably comes up at the moment now where we wonder how much is left in Rafa yeah <clears throat> we'll get to the audio I guess in a minute but um it was difficult watching that the last set in particular whereby you knew the match was beyond him uh, he knew the match was beyond him his box knew the match was beyond him and yet he wanted to continue on and, and go out on a shield essentially uh, in a way that kind of old warriors do uh, there's now a sense that he just needs to see how his body recovers um, I don't think if he's going to retire anywhere he'll, he'll want to retire I guess in Paris where it's been like a, such a, a fecund place for him in terms of winning trophies um, I don't think you'll want to go out like this um, whereby he's injured and goes out in the second round of a slam that isn't usually his favourite anyway regardless of winning it last year to the world number 65 he wants to go out on a high and I think that's what he'll be targeting um, that said it was a shock to see him go out this morning while I was getting up and was looking forward to Raducanu and Goff and mm-hmm. presumed that everything overnight was going to be pretty straightforward and saw Nadal's result and went go excuse me um, yeah, it's, it, it's very strange to see this generation. We talked about it before. We talked about it a bit with Murray on Monday. We talked about it before, obviously, when Federer retired. To see that generation of player slowly wither away and slowly erode from, like, drifting away like that picture in Back to the Future, uh, where the family members are all fading away one by one, uh, unless Marty gets to rectify the past. Um, it's a lot like that, watching these players fade away now. So does that mean, Mick, to carry this analogy out, that the, the, Djokovic, the Djokovic is the last one remaining and he holds the picture with Federer gone, Murray gone, no, and Nadal no, gone? No, 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 Will. Will, it basically means that Djokovic has to score Andy Murray uh, by the end of the Australian Open for everything to be right in the world again. <laughs> that is not the analogy I expected. That's far more Kenny Cunningham's back to the future. film club. Um, <laughs> I think more so than us talking about the Australian Open. But um, Rafa Nadal, uh, again, it's the hip injury, which hits a lot of players at that age, same as Andy Murray. As Richie mentioned, we're going to have to wait and see how he is at recovery. He's not that one going to be back fully fit for Roland Garros and for the summer with Wimbledon. But um, I'm okay with this. Like I, these lads have lasted so long now. I think there's an element of like there's fun watching Nadal and Murray in the early stages of a tournament, and if one of them does go on a run at some point, you know, like I don't know, there's always that 
Jimmy Connors in the 1991 US Open is like the Jimmy Connors was like 32 at the time as well you know he's much younger than these guys um, I could be wrong about that I'm not sure but I get the impression he, he was younger than these guys are now and there's something lovely and romantic about that but if it's just all the time and it's just like Nadal no matter how old and injured and decrepit he is he's still managing to get to semi-finals and finals and there's something seriously wrong with your sport no matter how great somebody is so I think I think there's a I think this is good in a way you know but again it's like would I like to see him go and win the French now and just have that one more one more run and everybody getting behind him and we might actually all watch the French Open for a change if that's the case I think that's what you want here but I think it's okay to see these lads fade in front of our eyes Richie dying under yeah not going out on their sword it is yeah sword, it's, it's just dying under shield it, 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 <laughs> you're mixing it, it, analogies there but. yeah it, I, I guess it has that whole thing of of mortality and, and whether it's your own or whether it's your favourite sports people, you don't like to be reminded yeah. of it, regardless of how much you want to watch them. You don't like to be reminded that A, they're getting old uh, and B, we all are too. That's what I was going to yeah. say. You you had a Which big birthday upstairs. there last year, Richie, so that's probably Wish what no that's makeup. Don't be going into that now. I, I, fact checked. Oh, arseways. Completely <laughs> arseways. 1992 was, not 1991 and Jimmy Collins was 39, which is older than... <laughs> he, he, he aged oh. seven years. In yeah. the, Th- the thanks for checking months. that, Arthur. <laughs> I was happy enough in my ignorance. <laughs> Arthur would be very quick. Oh, it was 91. It was 91. Oh, well then, at least you got the year right. Just seven years out. He just gave me a, huh. the year, he what age he was in 92. <laughs> Feeling this could welcome up in the crappy quiz uh, this weekend. It'll probably have a tennis feel about it on Friday. Uh, the news round, of course, is brought to you by Gillette Labs for an effortless finish to your day. Uh, Rich, we're kicking off the news round with Rafa. Yeah, Rafa Nadal's future in tennis in doubt following his second round exit from the Australian Open this morning. The defending champion had to contend with that hip injury as he fell to a straight sets defeat to the world number 65, Mackenzie McDonald. Nadal hinted that the severity of the injury may determine his decision to continue on in the sport. Can't say that I am not destroyed <laughs> mentally at this time because I will be lying. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's hard for me, you know, uh, but... But let's see. I mean, hopefully it's nothing too bad. And at the end, uh, have been three positive weeks in terms of practice. So I, I really hope that that don't uh, put me out of the court for a, for a long time. Because <laughs> then it's it's tough to to make all the recovery again. Uh, it's not only the recovery. It's all the the amount of work that you need to put together to to come back uh, at a decent level. So uh, I went through this process uh, too many times in my career and uh, I am ready to keep to keep doing, I think. Uh, but that's not, <laughs> uh, that's not easy without a doubt. Yeah, Rafa Nadal there speaking in Melbourne after his second round defeat at the Australian Open today. This is when you come into your own, Richie, by the way, when you now reel off the next set of results from Melbourne and you take relish in uh, going through various different languages and various different pronunciations and invariably getting them right, Mick McCarthy. I would oh, say. Uh, do you know what I was really impressed with yesterday? And I didn't have time to go into it. I think just uh, knocked off, I, I'm not, I don't even remember the name, it was like Alexandra Val- Valafichenka or something like that. It was just. Alexandra Sasnovich. No, it wasn't actually. It was definitely. No. It sounded Pavlyuchenko, the Spurs player, was the, oh, was the name An- it reminded Anasta- me of. A- A- yeah, Anastasia Pavlyuchenko. Yeah. There you yeah. go. Pavly- oh. It's the, it's the even. There's an extra syllable at the end of that there, and he just like you know what a pro, just straight <laughs> in there, not not even it's a called, blink. It's called doing your job, Mick. It's yeah. Called doing your job. Couldn't have teed you up any better, Richie, for that. Yeah, John Millman and Cameron Norrie are difficult to get through. I'm not going to lie to you, Will. Uh, there are no such problems for Daniel Medvedev today. Uh, the back-to-back runner-up beat Aussie wildcard John Millman in straight sets. He could face McDonald in the quarterfinals if all things go to plan for both. Men's third seed Stefanos Tsitsipas lost just five games en route to a straight sets win over Rinky Hichikata. It's Talon Greek Spore next for the Greek. Uh, there were also wins today for Cameron Norrie, Francis Tiafo, and the six seed Felix Auger Aliasim. Women's seven seed Coco Goff got the better of the clash of the young guns, beating Emirati. Kanu 6376. It's compatriot Bernarda Pera next for Coco. In the same quarter of the draw, top seed Iga Fiontech beat Camilla Azorio and she'll play Spanish qualifier Christina Buxha in round three. Also victorious today in the women's draw were the third seed Jessica Bagula, six seed Maria Sicari, and Bagula's fellow Americans Madison Keys and Danielle Collins. Mm, ten Chinese players now at this stage, Richie, have been banned. This is match fixing in snooker. 
Yeah, 10 players officially charged today with max, match fixing allegations. All had been provisionally suspended up until this point. Former Masters champion Yan Bing Tao and the UK Championship winner Zhao Zintang are among those due to face an independent disciplinary tribunal. WPBSA chair Jason Ferguson says the 10 players could face lifetime bans if found guilty. And there's also the prospect of prosecution in their home country. But despite the severity of this news, Ferguson says they're still hoping to bring televised snooker back to China for the first time since the pandemic. Mm. A few months away from the World Championship, Mick. This is obviously not a, a great look for snooker right now. No, absolutely not. Uh, <clears throat> kind of gone on and on a little bit as well. So, yeah, hopefully there's a, I don't know, a line drawn under it soon. But, yeah, no, not a good look at all. No. Um, Especially now what you're looking at some of the major players. Is, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. big names there. there, yeah. yeah. Um, meanwhile, the cricket today... Disappointment in the T20 series and more heartbreak for Ireland against Zimbabwe in a different form today. Yeah, today was rough, to be honest with you, especially the ending. Ireland enduring a heartbreaking final ball defeat in their first one-day international with Zimbabwe. Centuries from captain Andy Balburnie and Harry Tector had set Ireland up nicely as they posted a target of 289 for their hosts. Zimbabwe were looking wobbly until a rain delay cut their innings down to 37 overs. It made things rather more manageable for them. Clive Madande's four off the final delivery of the match secured a three-wicket victory for Zimbabwe via the DLS method. Next up is a meeting of the sides on Saturday when Ireland will look to level the series. Manchester United in action tonight, Mick, in the Premier League. Potentially go up to second place if they beat Crystal Palace. This is the catch-up game from the one that was postponed following the death of Queen Elizabeth II. Uh, so we're effectively getting to the halfway point of the season properly now, because teams are coming around to 19 rounds mm-hmm. of games played. I don't think too many people would have thought Manchester United five games into the season were going to be up to second no, place. Certainly not two games into the season mm. after the, those two results. Yeah, we, I think it's probably fair to say in... Uh, offside gate we probably didn't give United enough credit on Monday when we were sort of looking back on that and then ended up sort of talking a good bit about City in, in, in the football show as well and like United's turnaround has been amazing like and they've been they've been brilliant I suppose we're still at a question like uh, it's like if they win tonight grand that's like another <laughs> really good win on a really good run but then it's like if they could do it on Sunday and be too beat the big two almost for this season two weeks in a row then you have to start having real conversations about whether United are in a title race or whether they can keep this going my sense at the moment and I don't know if if it's something you'd share I think a lot of United fans that I talk to share is that this is a purple patch where a lot is going right and there still are some some problems to fix there that will kind of come up before the end of the season and that you know a comfortable qualification for the Champions League is what they'll be looking at you know, this year, which is an ama- amazing progress from last year, and that there is lots of good stuff to build on then for next year and the year after. I don't know if a, a title run is quite in the capabilities of this squad at the moment. But again, they win tonight and they win at the weekend against Arsenal. You know, you're probably having to, it's like Arsenal, it's like over the course of the year, they can convince you of something that you didn't quite believe. You know, so right now I would say we're not in title race. Uh, territory for United but I could probably talk myself into it Richie I'll play devil's advocate here Manchester United fans yeah. are going to say when Arsenal went to Old Trafford they played them off the pitch they could do it yeah. again this weekend who played Arsenal United played Arsenal? Arsenal off the pitch yeah. D- did you watch that match I'm not saying then, but that's <laughs> they took their goals very very well within the Arsenal game I thought they way won. better than them that night. that was w- such a lucky win for United no Ooh. sorry lucky is the wrong word because you have to go <laughs> win the game that's, that's you've now a, used the word it lucky it was impressive it was an impressive win for United that day but Arsenal uh, were very unlucky I didn't think I didn't think Arsenal deserved to lose that game at all what do you reckon Rich I did six points over the next uh, was it four or five days and they're very much in the title hunt very very much in the title hunt because I think it's one of those years <clears throat> where as soon as you start building momentum and that's the problem for City this year is that they can't seem to get any going they'll they'll take you know two steps forward and they'll be one back um, United are on a run of five is it five wins in a row in the Premier League six in all competitions win again tonight and that keeps trucking that kind of is self-sustaining in its own way and the confidence that that yeah. breeds is, mm. is huge I agree with and that. I really think that it, like a win tonight against a decent Crystal Palace side and they'll bring it through the starting 11s in a minute a win tonight if they if they beat Arsenal and that is a big if um, because their midfield is performing well he's starting to get their defence to perform well Ten Hag is getting tunes out of full backs that we'd all written off long long ago 
Um, and now they've, you know, obviously added to their forward line too. So it's not beyond the realms of possibility. It really isn't. And all of that credit, when you think of Ten Hag rocking up to Selhurst Park to watch United when he was yet to be formally placed in charge and being an absolute shambles uh, towards the end of last season, mm. the turnaround that he is instilled in that club, getting rid of your man off to Saudi Arabia, is just <laughs> remarkable. Absolutely <laughs> remarkable. <laughs> I completely agree. As as Will has a coffin fit here uh, at your uh, priority there, but I I think I think there's something to be said for uh, you find yourself accidentally in a title race, mm. and there's something to be said for the fact that you're playing for Manchester United. It will feel quite natural. It will feel like this is where we belong, and you know there there won't almost be that white line fever that you might get if you were a Spurs, for example, and you found yourself in this position. You know just by tradition uh, alone so in confidence wise and stuff like that there is there is a, absolutely a possibility yeah. that United find themselves on this run and momentum and form just keeps it going and Arsenal have a few bad results City continue their current form and suddenly they have they're right in there you know I just I, I have to say if, I, if you put a gun to my head I would say that I would think that there is flaws still in that squad that will be exposed at some point in the year uh, they've had a I don't think we they beat Manchester City cannot be taken away from them. Deserve to win that match as well, despite terrible offside decisions, right? Unlike the Arsenal game that you're talking about, Will. Uh, I think I, but, I think that was a classic Man United versus Arsenal game. United soaked up the pressure and beat them. I know, I'm only joking. But they did deserve to beat City at the weekend. But you have to admit that the run they've had since they lost to Villa uh, before the World Cup has been remarkably easy. Mm. You know, they've had it. You, you won't get a run like that in the Premier League very often, you know. So now they go to Palace tonight. That's not easy, but it's, it, it's, it's an okay fixture and it does start to get tougher from here. So this is like, you know, continuing this form isn't straightforward over the next month or so. Yeah, whatever we're getting rushed into form, the real credit for Ten Hag should be getting our Juan Bazaki into form. A player who was absolutely written off just a few months ago. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Really well at the weekend uh, against Man City. Team News, Richie, you have it there for tonight for the big game. Yeah, the big man is in for Manchester United tonight who continue with David De Gea in goal. Back four then of Aaron Wan-Bissaka, Rafael Varane, Lissandro Martinez and Luke Shaw is restored to left back. Casemiro and Christian Eriksen are once again anchoring the midfield. In front of them, it's the trio of Anthony Bruno Fernandes and Marcus Rashford and up top new signing Vout Veghorst. Uh, for Palace, it looks like a 4-4-2 for them. Vincente Gaeta is in goal. It's a back four definitely of Nathaniel Klein, Mark Gehi. Omar Richards and Tyrick Mitchell in midfield and Czech Decore and Will Hughes either side of them Michael Alise and Wilfred Zaha Odson Edward is in support of Jean-Philippe Mateta there's also another FA Cup third round replay to be decided tonight Leeds welcome championship side Cardiff City to Ellen Road a Republic of Ireland internationals Callum Robinson and Callum O'Dowd are both on the bench for Cardiff but under 21 fullback Joel Bagan starts for the Welsh side. Kickoff at 7.45 there, and the winners will be away to either Accrington Stanley or Boreham Wood in round four. And Richie, just before we wrap, I didn't think I'd hear this. Podrick Harrington, Rookie of the Year. Yeah, he is indeed. Podrick Harrington has been awarded the Rookie of the Year uh, for the PGA Champions Tour. <laughs> he, of course, was a major winner at the Senior US Open this year, and he followed that with three more victories on the tour. Stephen Alker uh, was named the Champions Tour Player of the Year. There you go. Mick, many thanks. Richie, thanks a million as well. Nice and lads. Cheers, lads. Your chance to win big. News Talks Cash Machine. Now, we've had three rollovers in a row and the prize money is building up quickly. If you've entered since 5pm on Friday, you remain in the draw 